their futures. Soldiers speak out. We haven't forgot about Dave. There's four cards. So it's there. It's just never been put in this context before. But the numbers are there. And by the way, I, I need to add, uh, you know, the reporter, I've talked to the reporter from the Times, and uh, she was really kind of upset because there was a lot of people resisting giving her information. So this wasn't just a collection of all homicide. Since this has been done, uh, the Bunker Crawl, we've been involved in 10 murder cases. Uh, three of them are up there in Oregon. Actually, there's supposed to be a fourth one, but I can't find the computer program anymore. Okay, so the jail population, uh, just to give you in context, uh, how many people are from Oregon in here? Okay, this relates to you guys. All right, the jail population in Marion County or Salem, Oregon, is, they have about 650 to 700 prisoners. In 2007, I did a study of the Marion County Jail uh, at the request of the sheriff at that time. And basically what I found were 5% of the jail population uh, were made up of veterans. That's about 1,000 veterans per year booked into the Marion County Jail. In 2010, the new sheriff took it upon himself to do a self-report survey uh, of uh, veterans. And uh, in December, what he found out is that that number had doubled. It's now 10%. So we're now up to, at a minimum of 20, of, sorry, 2,000. So basically, it's a 100% increase. So business for young veterans, it's really good right now in the criminal justice system. OK, so the foundation of the rationale for concern. Uh, dead, wounded, Vietnam, we had 58,000. Uh, some people here are my age, so you know what that number means. Uh, Afghanistan, as of this morning, uh, was 1,689, and Iraq, 4,474. Um, sorry about these over here, they're a little bit slow in getting the wounded up, uh, but those are only good through May. Um, so why do I stay focused on all these KIAs? I actually check KIAs at least once or twice a week. Between November 19th and November 23rd, 1967, we lost 158 from the 173rd, and 358 were wounded, and 12 were missing in action. In all, in two battalions, the 2nd and 4th Battalion, uh, of the 570 soldiers, only 130 were not wounded. And I was one of the unlucky ones. That's why I keep track of the death count. Okay, so suicide, let's get to the fun part here. Uh, the other, what I call the other dead and wounded. The Vietnam vets committed suicide depends on whose data you want to use, uh, what book you want to use, it really doesn't matter. I don't think we were all that concerned during the post-Vietnam period and the Vietnam period of keeping track of suicide. Uh, in 2005, more than 6,000 veterans committed suicide. Uh, we know that to be factual. Oregon, actually, in 2005, had the highest young veteran suicide rate in the nation. Uh, 2002, about 350 attempted suicides in the Army. By 2007, that went up to 2,100. So we could call that a pretty good increase. Um, this is something I just recently ran across, and it, it really riveted me, so I assume maybe you guys will see that too. In 2009, there were 466 KIA in Iraq and Afghanistan. In that same year, there were 162 Army active duty suicides. In the Marines, there were 52 active duty suicides. That's a total of 214. So these are active duty soldiers, both groups, that died in 2009. 31% are by suicide. Takes more, by the way, to respond to suicide than just giving a little 
business card with a 1-800 number. I've always tried to figure if I wanted to do myself, why would I dial the 800 number and be put on hold? It doesn't make any sense. 2009, there were 80 suicides among active duty reserve, non-active duty reservists and National Guard members. Uh, in 2010, successful suicides went up to 145 in one year. So that's an 80% increase in non-active duty reservists and National Guard members. And being in Oregon, National Guard is the big thing uh, here as far as the military is concerned. So basically, our current U.S. veteran suicide rate is 18 per day. Uh, I've actually tried to insert this in testimony in courts and the judges don't like it, but now I can tell any goddamn person I want to because the Ninth Circuit Court just included it in their opinion on May 10th. So it, it's sad. So basically what that means is 6,500 per year, which in reality means there's more vets committing suicide every year than the combined veterans in Iraq and Afghanistan since October 2001. So it's pretty serious. And this is my fun one. Four to five of those 6,500, uh, or of those 18 per day, four or five of them, are under the direct care of the Veterans Administration. Uh, that means about 1,640 per year. Now, I had a PowerPoint slide up here and I took it off, it's gone now, uh, but I'm gonna go ahead and say it anyhow. Actually, if you think about it and being real cynical like I tend to be a lot of times, if the Taliban and Al Qaeda really wanted to do better work, they should come and have a meeting with the VA because <laughs> VA seems to be doing much better work than Al Qaeda and, and, and the Taliban. And I know that's not popular, but it's actually true. Okay, post-traumatic stress disorder. It's much more than the symptom guidelines offered in DSM-4. There is no cure for PTSD. Part two, there is no cure for PTSD. A little bit louder. Except I made a mistake. There might be one cure. A lobotomy. Short of that, there is no cure for PTSD. It's all about memory. Until you remove the part of the brain that stores the memory, you got the memory of that forever. So, there are various methods of treatment for PTSD. There's counseling, prescription medication. Thanks, Mike. Um, and there's self-medication. And the ones that I find the favorites are Jack Daniels and Budweiser for some reason. The positive side of alcohol as a self-medication for PTSD is drinking alcohol to blackout significantly reduces uh, obtrusive thoughts and nightmares. You don't have nightmares if you're totally wiped out on alcohol. So it is, in a way, a good drug. Not good afterwards. Now, some people with PTSD and veterans in general, whatever, have sleeping problems. And the VA actually has a solution to these sleeping problems. It's called Ambien. I've got five active cases right now, and uh, I'm gonna ask someone to speak here a little bit in a minute. Uh, I did have six. Uh, but he got a not guilty verdict in a trial here a couple weeks ago. But he's still not supposed to go back to Washington County. Okay. Ambien is designed for short-term use, three to five days. That's what the manufacturers say. But many veterans are given prolonged prescriptions of 30, 60, and 90 days of Ambien. Absolutely insane. So what are the un unintended benefits uh, or consequences? Depends on how you look at them, I guess. You can drive a vehicle and not know you're driving. You can attempt suicide and not be aware that you are one, attempting suicide, or that you are frightening others as you hold the gun up to your head. 
I wonder where I got that one from anyway. Okay. Uh, you can drink alcohol and not be aware that you're drinking alcohol. You can walk in your sleep and not be aware of it. Hell, you can forget you took an Ambien and go take another one and not realize that you're under the influence of Ambien at the time. So at this time, I'd like to just real quickly introduce Robert Helmut. Right there, he's an Iraq vet. And I actually think Ambien is really good. So what's your thoughts on that? I went to the VA to be prescribed, not to be prescribed medication. I went to the VA to pass in about sleep methods and stuff like that. And I was sent out the door with the medication. And I tried it, I went back, I said no. And I want some other ways. They got me to take another kind, and the other kind was Ambien, and it has been the last seven months of my life. Yeah. Um, my lovely uh, girlfriend here, she's pregnant. Uh, we had a, literally the last seven months, being on Ambien and drinking, you black out, you don't know what, yeah. There it is right there. That's exactly this is his story. That's my case. Yeah, and, uh, that's his case. Yeah. I just about lost everything that I had due to this incident. So, so you're not taking it now? <laughs> no. <laughs> about that, actually, I made the VA aware of what was going on with this after this incident, and they gave it about two weeks, and then they tried to prescribe it to me again. <laughs> and I said, okay, and I had them actually send it to me, and I didn't go talk to a doctor, I didn't talk to anybody. Some guy handed me a, a piece of paper saying that it'll be mailed to you within three to five days. So I get it in the mail, in a bag. So I kept that one on the side, you know, in case you might need hand me. I, mean, you know, I threw it away, but uh, that's my- But you thing. decided not to take it anymore. You weren't- I did. I tried it very few times. Uh, the first, I don't know, a couple months. And uh, when you mix it with alcohol, Actually, not even when you mix it with alcohol. She knows. You try Ambien, it, it makes you hallucinate. It make, yeah. But it helps you sleep. It just makes sleep and you don't even know about it. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. Doesn't sound okay. like the VA is taking care of our vets. Oh, <gasps> That's a weird <laughs> statement. That's Certainly a conclusion <laughs> we might come to. Okay. okay. Moving on to Pete. Thanks, Robert. Okay, moving on to PTSD, uh, you can learn to live with it. I know that for a fact. Uh, basically, you got to learn to disengage from triggering stimuli or things that set you up. You just have to learn to do it. And sometimes that's really hard. One of the hardest things is disengaging means you look like a wimp. You're backing away, and what, are ever, what is everybody going to think of you when you back up or leave the room? I mean, why not just get in a damn fist fight? You know, that, that's the real man way to do it. Uh, you know, but the real question I've come to live with is, or learn is, why do you care what in the hell other people think? That's the real stupid thing, and once you can get over that, because if you don't learn how to disengage, you, you are increasing your possibility to become part of or introduced to the criminal justice system. It's just that simple. Uh, why is it so hard to disengage? Military total institution, which is my area or whatever, for sociology, um, I assume that most, many of you are graduates of the Military Total Institution, so we'll take a real quick survey. Mike will do the counting because he's got the camera. Raise your hand if you went through basic training. Good, raise your hand if you went through AIT. Hmm. OTS. Uh, raise your hand if you went to advanced training, jump school, ranger school. I'd like to put OCS, but I don't call it advanced. Oh, uh, I thought it was stupid. Okay, raise your hand if you've ever been deployed to a combat zone. Hmm, interesting. Okay, so if you raised your hand once, you're a graduate. If you raised your hand twice, you're a graduate. 
if you kept your hand up, do you need any more Kool-Aid? Because you're pretty indoctrinated already. Okay, the military total institution to get to the boring stuff. A place of residence and work where a large number of like-situated individuals cut off from the wider society for a substantial period of time together lead an enclosed, formally administered routine of life. Sound familiar to anybody in the military? It's an army base. That's what it is. Categories of the military total institution. Old people's place, where I'm headed some days. Uh, actually, not. I'm going to the woods. Okay, for the incapable, mental hospitals. For the threatening, prisons. For retreat training and convents. And the other one, of course, for instrumental purposes, which means to make something happen, the military. So those are your, those are your five components of the military total institution. Okay, the heart of it. Obedience, submissiveness, obey orders without question. Discipline, necessary to correct, mold, or perfect mental faculties to think and respond militarily. Even a lot of people that are opposed to the military, they don't like it anymore. If you made it through basic and you made it through AIT, you complied with this. That's the only way you got through it. Otherwise, you couldn't have. Uh, survival. How do you survive? By any means necessary. Period. A dead soldier or Marine is worthless to their buddy. That's simple. So survival is important. Sacrifice. Sacrifice your individuality. Sleeping in a bunk with somebody down below you or above you or however the configuration is today. Uh, you know, or that sacrifice, or the ultimate sacrifice, sacrifice your own life. And another one is fight or flight. Lots of people have fear, but what the military insists is you learn to overcome that fear, and you reject the flight option, and you select fight. That's it. I mean, think about it. If you had been in basic training or AIT or something like that and pugil stick training, I don't even know if they have it anymore or not, but if they did, I mean, you've got somebody on the ground and, you know, okay, he's done, and you back away. I mean, what's a drill sergeant going to say to you? You know, you finish him off, and that's it. Uh, finish him off. What does that really mean? I was on a murder case in John Day, Oregon in 2008. Uh, Jesse Bratcher case. And what's shocking about that is Jesse bought a 45, went to confront the guy that allegedly raped his pregnant girlfriend, uh, and he unloaded the magazine. It was in a flashback mode. And, you know, nobody could understand. Well, God, you shot him in the damn head. Why'd you have to empty the magazine? Because that's how you were trained to do it. That's why. And it was instinctive. Because if you're in a flashback mode, you're not in the civilian world. You're in the military world. And that's what people have a real hard time understanding. Not you guys, but the people outside out there, when you tell them that, they just, their head spins. Well, why don't you just go by the law? You know, or if you got PTSD, why don't you just get over it? You know, take a pill, and you do. Okay, uh, these are the ones that I call high-risk MOSs. Uh, infantry, cavalry scout, M1 armored crewman, combat medic, infantry, blah, blah, and Marine. Uh, Navy corpsman assigned to a U.S. Marine Corps infantry unit. Uh, generally required to consume more Kool-Aid than other MOS classification. It's just factual. Reasons for the higher risk. Type of training. Combat versus rear area. That's a little less likely now, or have been in Iraq, in Afghanistan, but you get the idea. Levels of training if you've had advanced. Training focus. Is it tactical or technical? Kill. That's it. 
Period. In the story. You don't need any more. That's all it is. Kill. Technical, fix the computer. Actual experiences, if you had combat confrontation. Uh, level of Kool-Aid. How addicted are you? Going to Ranger School, things like that. Very addicted. You're totally brain dead as far from my point of view today. Common thread to all combat veterans. A person becomes a member of the military, deployed to a combat region, influenced by the level of contact uh, with the opposition in that region, cannot return to the civilian world as the original person who left that world. That person is dead. They're gone. There's no way that person's coming back unless after reincarnation, and that's a whole other PowerPoint thing. Okay, the more contact, the more change the person is more likely to experience. Offense is often related to PTSD in the military total institution. Murder, assault, drugs, alcohol related offenses. Domestic violence, child abuse, attempted suicide, yeah. In some jurisdictions, it's a crime, uh, which is really sick to me because that tells the person, uh, you know, if you get away with this and you go to do it again, make certain you finish it. It's kind of crazy to me. Uh, PTSD by itself uh, has a poor track record in the criminal courts. It actually does. Uh, juries and judges tend to ask, why don't they just get over it? You've been back for two years. In the case of some Vietnam vets, my God, you've been back for 40 years. Talk about slow. How long does it take you to get over that? The Iraq vets, uh, a year, two years, three years, four years, five years. Why don't you get over it? The thing is, combining PTSD with the idea of the military total institution, in a nutshell, what it does, PTSD helps you go ahead and understand that the person has traumatic events inside the memory and certain things trigger those off and they sort of lose it or lose control. The military total institution explains why you did what you did after the PTSD was triggered. That's the big distinction. So it's a two-pronged approach for defense. Assuming defense wants to do that. Okay, you or another vet is arrested. Hopefully there's no cops in here. Do not say anything to the arresting officer. Ask for an attorney. Tell the attorney you're a vet. If the attorney doesn't seem to care that you're a vet, call this number. And if you can't call, ask a family member to call. So I'm a journalist. I'm not, I've never been in the Army. Um, and I came to this very skeptical. If I had been, just been sitting here um, listening to Bud, not knowing what I know now, I would have said, okay, prove it. How do I know you're not just making convenient excuses for the man who tried to beat up the nurses at the VA hospital? I mean, maybe he's an alcoholic for different reasons. There are lots of people who go to war who are not, who or who do not go to war, who are alcoholics. There are lots of people who do go to war who are not alcoholics. I would have said to him, I don't know. It's anecdotal. I mean, I feel for these guys. Thank you for your service, but I'm not convinced. And the way that I became convinced um, is the story of, of these men, the Band of Brothers that we all know from World War II. Fast forward to the Iraq War, the 503rd, um, sorry, 506 Infantry. Um, I was working as a, a newspaper reporter in Colorado Springs. Started there right around the time the Iraq War started. Um, and starting in about 2006, we had a number of uh, young Iraq veterans, some of them still active duty, some just barely out getting arrested for violent crimes, mostly major violent crimes, attempted murder and murder. Um, and these are all individual cases, the types of headlines you see in any major city newspaper all the time. You know, guy picked up for murder, you know, vet um, 
arrested in shooting last night, things like that. And what we weren't doing as a newspaper, what newspapers are not good at doing, uh, is we weren't connecting the dots. You know, we, over two years, we had 15 murders. Okay, so each of those is a day, day's story, right? Maybe another day when the court case comes around. Um, but there was no one saying, is there, is there a larger thread between all of these? Um, and fortunately, there's a couple public defenders here in the um, uh, audience. My wife is a, a defense attorney who works for the state. And a lot of these guys uh, um, are poor enough that they, when you get they get arrested for murder, they qualify for free um, defense attorney. And so I had uh, an ear into her office. You know, because we discussed things over the dinner table. And I knew that a lot of these guys um, had had really horrific experiences in Iraq, things that directly fed into the unraveling of their lives. And I also knew that, that almost all of them were coming out of one uh, battalion at Fort Carson. And for non-veterans in here, battalions of more or less 500 guys. Um, Fort Carson is 30,000 people. Why was there one unit of 500 people that had so many people arrested for murder, or attempted murder? Well, as a journalist, that's what I wanted to find out. Um, we have one guy who came home from a tour uh, in Ramadi, and nine days after getting home, uh, shot his wife 12 times and then shot himself. Um, one of his good friends was picked up just a few months later for shooting two men in a bar. Um, a little bit later, there was uh, two soldiers who were driving around late at night, picked up another soldier at a 7-Eleven, robbed him of like $8, and then shot him in the face. Um, there was two other soldiers who, who went out partying at a popular GI bar, ran into a guy who they knew and liked. They all got drunk when they were driving home, um, the guy that they had met started throwing up in the car. They got in a fight about the fact that he had thrown up in the car, and the driver shot him. Um, shortly thereafter, uh, a guy strangled his girlfriend. Um, all these random crimes, most of them gun crimes, out of young guys, um, most of whom, when you dug up their files, had a, a number of citations for good service. Um, what had happened? Once I figured out that we were talking about one battalion, I wanted to know that. And of course, if you ask the army, they'd say, well, you know, there's a couple bad apples in every group, and, and these guys probably would have done what they'd done anyway. And remember, I'm a skeptic. I want to know that that's not true. So I started looking at the numbers. OK, one battalion. How many murders did we have in that battalion of 500 guys in one year? We had eight. OK. So what would be the normal uh, murder rate for that group of guys if they were the normal population? It would be about 0.02. But then I started thinking, well, that's not fair. You know, the, we're talking about all young men. It's 100% men, and you know, the median age in there is like 23. You know, so who, who is the demographically in the whole population? Who's the most likely people to get arrested for murder? Bingo, men between the ages of you know, 18 and 25. So I said, okay, what? Let me compare the rate of this battalion to those guys so that I can make sure I'm not making a mistake that this is an elevated level. And it turned out that they were 3,000% higher than what you might expect. That is not a statistical blip. That is not a few bad apples. Something happened. And so since the Army obviously wasn't going to tell me what happened, the officers weren't going to tell me what happened. The thing for me to do, the only thing to do, was start with these guys who are in prison. Talk to them. Have them connect you with their friends, guys who were there, guys who can tell you as a group the story of this unit, what they went through, what happened when they came home, what happened to these guys. And so I tried to tell that story um, through the book, it's through the voices of these guys, the perspective of these guys. Um, it's a unit that started in Korea. They had been trained to fight a real infantry war. If the million North Koreans all of a sudden came over the line, they were trained to fight to the very end, expected to take 90% casualties, all-out war. They get to use all their war toys. They're all trained for that. The helicopters, 
the tanks, they've got these you know, missiles, everything, they're ready, and then all of a sudden they're going to Iraq. Because it turns out that the Iraq war, which was supposed to last six months, mm -hmm. a year in it wasn't going so good, and they needed to replace that first group of troops. So these guys went with no training over to Iraq, where they're essentially, high, all of a sudden they're highway patrol. Forget all out war. You're going to um, patrol a, a very bad part of the western desert of of uh, Iraq. Um, you're going to attempt to build uh, community relations. Hopefully you'll find some bad guys. Uh, by the way, there's no enemy there that anyone can tell that you can shoot at, but you're taking very high casualties, um, and we don't really know what to do with that. This was at the very beginning of the IED war when there wasn't even armor on the Humvees. They didn't see this coming. Um, that was their first tour. Um, their second tour was uh, in the middle of, of Baghdad, in the middle of the surge. This is when order had broken down so much that the Sunnis and the Shia both realized the only way that they were going to survive was to kill each other. And by the way, along the way, they're both going to try and kill the Americans. So they were set in the middle of that to try and calm that down. Uh, in both cases, they took casualties at about four times the rate of most other combat units. Uh, so they went through the ringer. Uh, and when they came home, well, uh, they came home to the infrastructure that was there for the war that was supposed to last six months. Um, an army that really had no experience in dealing with psychological injury. Uh, what these guys would go through, um, you, you know, the stress of, uh, well, you know, rather than tell you about it, I'm going to read a real short section. I find this is the best way to give you an idea of, of why um, these guys would come back to uh, Colorado Springs or anywhere, any city in the United States, and not be able to fit in um, and end up in prison where they did. So I just have a real quick uh, vocab section here. So these guys, and for combat vets here, probably don't need a lot of the vocab. So one of the words I use in here is a saw. These guys use a weapon called a saw, which is a squad automatic weapon. It's not like for cutting wood. Uh, and it's like a, a, a medium weight machine gun. Uh, the other is they were patrolling um, something called Route Michigan, which is picture a um, four lane divided American interstate. Uh, this was the main road connecting um, uh, Ramadi and Baghdad. Their job was to make sure it, was, it stayed cool. And because this job involved so many burned out cars and crazy uh, bombs and, and um, daily firefights, they called their their patrol operation, Operation Mad Max, after the bad 1980s movie. So I'm going to start, I'm going to take you back to 2004, their first tour. And I'm going to start with a, a young guy, later arrested for murder, 21-year-old um, Kenny Eastridge. He's from Louisville, Kentucky. By the end of the week, when Kenny Eastridge learned his platoon was going back on three days of Mad Max, Everybody was on edge. The platoon had been trained early on to protect themselves from ambushes by watching for anything out of the ordinary. Problem was, they also learned pretty quickly that almost everything in their corner of Iraq was out of the ordinary. Every day, the soldiers struggled to find meaningful hints of what was normal in their patrol areas. Three people dressed head to toe in black robes, their faces half covered except for glaring eyes. Was that normal? Seven men in headscarves packed into a tiny taxi. Was that normal? A burning mound of trash in the middle of the neighborhood with goats foraging around the edges. Was that normal? And then some of the things that appeared the most normal were the most deadly. A person on a cell phone, a boy on a bicycle, three teenagers in tracksuits, a clear strip of highway. Any of them could be a sign of an imminent bomb attack or not. There was no normal. Several hours into the patrol, the platoon's captain called on the radio. The battalion had had a tip that a group of insurgents in a car packed with explosives was on its way from Ramadi to Fallujah. He wanted to meet the platoon just west of a tiny little village called Chaldea to set up a roadblock. The platoon rolled towards a stretch of Route Michigan just block blocks from a mosque they had raided the day before. They parked their three Humvees along the side of the highway at around 1 p.m. and began to block off all traffic coming out of Ramadi. 
Jose Barco, a 19-year-old kid from Miami, and two other soldiers pulled on leather gloves. They heaved a big coil of razor wire off the hood of one of the trucks and began stringing it across the pavement. Eastridge stood guard a few feet away with his big saw gun at the ready. On his side of the street, a few bullet-riddled houses baked in the sun. On the other side, a cluster of pathetic-looking shops rippled in the heat, their owners staring out at the soldiers through the windows. Eastridge's job was to stand watch over his sergeant, Sean Huey, while the sergeant directed the traffic search. At the moment, Huey was conferring with the platoon sergeant about where to put an observation post. The street was full of people in cars. Women in long black hijabs ambled in and out of the shops. A group of children played nearby in the dust. If there was normal, this looked close to it. It was a sign that despite days of violence in the past week, all was well. The platoon's medic, 21-year-old Ryan Krebs, walked up to Eastridge and asked the platoon sergeant if it was OK for him to have a smoke. The sergeant replied that Krebs knew soldiers were not allowed to smoke in public. And since the captain was there, he had to be strict about the rules. He nodded his head towards a Humvee 50 yards up the road where the company's commander had just pulled up. The captain was adamant that the soldiers present a face of professionalism and respect to the civilians. And that meant, amongst other things, no smoking. But the platoon had been out on their shift for hours, and Doc Krebs said he really needed a smoke. Eastridge, the sergeant barked. Go take this guy down the alley and give him a smoke. So Eastridge and Krebs ducked past the platoon sergeant's Humvee, which was parked at the mouth of a narrow mud brick alley, and walked several paces down the corridor to sit on the toppled wall of a half-destroyed house. On the wide lanes of Route Michigan, Jose Barco pulled the dancing coil of razor wire across the hot pavement. Other soldiers stood in the waves of heat with hands resting on their rifles. A group of Iraqi men circled in tense conversation on the side of the road, walked over to Barco and the others stringing wire, and asked them to move the Humvee blocking the alley so that they could get through to their houses. The platoon sergeant looked at the Iraqis, he looked at the Humvee, he looked at the alley, and then he told them they'd have to go around. The truck wasn't moving. The men hurried back across the street, arguing in Arabic. Hey, Barco, can I borrow your gloves? A soldier said. Barco turned his head to answer. It was the last thing that he remembers. At that moment, a suicide bomber speeding down Route Michigan veered across the median, aimed at the Humvee blocking the alley, and released his detonation trigger. Instantly, a flash of heat and concussion shattered the shock windows. The soldiers felt it before they heard it as a shockwave slapped them to the ground. Glass and metal flew everywhere. Fire swallowed the roadblock. The force rippled up the alley and hurled Krebs and Eastridge to the, desert, to the dirt. They were hit so hard that at first they thought someone had dropped a grenade on their heads. Everyone lay dazed in a fog of dust as their shaken brains reset. It lasted only a second or two, but it seemed to stretch minutes. Are you OK? Eastridge finally said to the medic as he pulled himself up to his knees. The medic coughed and started patting himself for holes. I don't know, am I? Yeah, Eastridge said, scanning him. Am I? Krebs scanned Eastridge for wounds and his eyes glanced up over his head to a huge cloud of thick black smoke rising over the street. Oh fuck, he stammered. Oh fuck. Eastridge whipped around and saw the oily smoke. He grabbed Krebs by the shoulder and they sprinted down the alley into the black cloud. Confusion hung there, as thick as the smoke. The Army combat medic training had drilled the decision-making tools needed to sort through the chaos into Krebs over and over, but nothing prepared him for what he saw. He followed Eastridge as they squeezed past the mangled, burning wreck of the Humvee. The suicide bomber's car was nowhere to be seen. The blast had destroyed it almost completely. As Krebs and Eastridge edged into the street, Tiny pieces of metal pelted down through the mist and smoke and dust like scorching rain. Silhouettes of bodies materialized in the haze, some moving, some not. An Iraqi woman appeared through the gloom, weeping as she tried to drag two children out of the road. The limp, ragged bodies had been cut into pieces. The strict priorities of combat medic mandated that American soldiers always come first, so Krebs groped past the woman and pushed further into the kill zone. From every direction, members of the platoon dashed, dashed towards the blast site, while civilians stumbled away. Crabs, what they do. 
those who are going to live no matter what you do, and those who may live or may die depending on what you do at that moment. Bloody or not, Krebs decided the sergeant was going to live no matter what he did, at least for now. And so Krebs told a nearby soldier to give the sergeant some morphine, bandage his wounds, and then he pushed on. Krebs passed another soldier whose cheek had been sliced open by shrapnel and hung, revealing the bloody jaw and teeth beneath. A shard of metal was stuck in the jawbone. He too was going to live. So Krebs kept going. He got to another soldier who was bleeding from the face and eyes and yelling, I can't see, I can't see. He was going to live. The medic hurried towards a pile of burning wreckage where the captain and some other soldiers, half obscured by acrid smoke, were wrestling blistering razor wire off of the tangle of soldiers. Krebs took a half step towards the car and then saw Eastridge's squad leader, Sean Huey, who had been standing just moments ago, suddenly crumpled to the ground. The medic hurried over and knelt down. He saw blood spurting from the sergeant's left thigh. Huey was paper white and gulping air like a trout. The medic probed along his right thigh where a chunk of car had punched through both legs, right below the pelvis, clipping both femoral arteries. Blood was flooding out in a spreading pool. If he didn't get care right now, he was not going to live. And so Krebs tried to apply pressure to stop the bleeding, but watched his whole hand sink into the wound. He tried again and again, but the sergeant's breathing just grew shallower. Eastridge stood by, just a few steps from them, scanning the road with his saw. He scanned the muzzle along the bullet-pocked buildings glaring down on Route Michigan. He was waiting for the rest of the ambush. His barrel passed over Krebs and Butler, frantically working on their favorite sergeant. It passed over the charred, ragged, bleeding bodies on the road. It passed over the smoking wreckage where a soldier with blood dripping from, his cuts, from cuts on his face was yelling, they're burning, they're burning, help me, they're burning. In the wreckage, Eastridge's eyes fell on his friend Jose Barco. The 19-year-old Cuban kid was pinned by the flaming front end of the suicide bomber's car. Eastridge watched Barco heave away the wreckage with the help of two soldiers. Then the private somehow stood up, wobbling in shock, blood soaking into his uniform from a hundred jagged bits of car that had hit him like a shotgun blast. Eastridge heard Barco start yelling, I'll kill those motherfuckers, I'll kill those motherfuckers. Give me those we my weapon and I'll kill those motherfuckers. Half of his uniform was still on fire. The captain told his sergeants that no one in the platoon was leaving until after sundown. They were going to guard the chunks of the suicide bomber's body now slung all over the block. In the Muslim faith, the captain said, a person must be buried before sundown to go to heaven. He suspected the friends of the bomber were waiting for, to bury their latest martyr, and the band of brothers was not going to let that happen. They stayed for hours, guarding the gruesome scene. A few locals tried to collect pieces of the suicide bomber's body in buckets, and the soldiers raised their rifles and ordered them to dump their buckets back on the asphalt. I'm just going to skip a, a couple paragraphs and then read one more paragraph. But in the paragraphs I, I skip, the injured guys are taken um, uh, to uh, the medevac, where the, the sergeant who was wounded in the legs quickly dies, Sergeant Huey. And um, Jose Barco, the Cuban kid who was on fire, um, lives and is medevac to um, Walter Reed in Washington, D.C. And now I'm going to just so skip a few hours from that last scene. As the sun went down, Eastridge tried to keep himself squared away. He was now guarding the same alley where the blast had knocked him to the dirt. Now, in the failing light, a spine lay in the narrow passage between the walls. No flesh, no ribs, no explanation, just a human spine. Eastridge's battalion had spent months preparing for Iraq, and here they were, totally unprepared. He had been trained to shoot. He had been, he had been in an attack that had wounded several soldiers and killed the man whom he counted on most, Sergeant Huey, but he had not been able to fire a shot in defense. Guns were almost useless on Route Michigan. There was no way to defend against a roadside bomber, a suicide bomber. All the training to outshoot, outmaneuver, and outthink enemy soldiers 
proved futile because the enemy in Iraq was not a soldier. He was a shadow, a disease that wafted invisibly through the civilian population. It made Eastridge furious that these locals let the scumbags hide in their midst. He was enraged that they had killed Sergeant Huey, his mentor, his leader, the one he had always looked to for answers. And now their platoon sergeant was out of the picture too. They still had eight months left in Iraq. Eastridge thought to himself, who's going to lead the platoon? What are we going to do? He felt faint. He put his hand down on the crumbled wall to steady himself and felt something warm and wet in his palm. He had accidentally leaned into a piece of lung or liver or something, he didn't know what. Oh God, he said, jerking his hand away and wiping the blood in a long smear down the wall. This is not what he had signed up for. He felt even fainter. He went to steady himself and he put his hand right back in the liver. So I'm gonna end this by telling you two things. One, the next day they had to go out and do the same thing um, on the same road. And they had to do the same thing on the same road all day, every day, for um, 12 months. Uh, and then I wanted to let you know what happened to some of these guys. Um, Kenny Eastridge, the guy I ended with, um, did another tour in Iraq in, in the um, surge and uh, kind of melted down right towards the end of the tour and, and um, started killing uh, civilians in Iraq willy-nilly. Um, and he was uh, confined to the FOB for that. They obviously decided that he couldn't go out on patrols anymore. Um, and then he assaulted his commanding officer and they um, court-martialed him, uh, kicked him out of the army because they decided he was too dangerous to be in Iraq. They sent him back to Colorado Springs, which is sort of problematic about. Um, he was involved in two different uh, armed up robberies that he wasn't caught for shortly after getting back to Colorado Springs, uh, and then a murder that he was. Um, he's now in prison. Uh, Jose Barco, the guy who was set on fire, uh, went back to Walter Reed, um, got great care, uh, skin grafts, um, was sent back to Fort Carson to be medically retired. Well, he felt a very sort of familiar and almost universal bond to the men that he had been fighting with. And he did, couldn't bear to be apart from them. And so he snuck back into the uh, active duty roster on, uh, for the unit and deployed with them uh, on the second uh, deployment, even though officially doctors had said you can't go back to Iraq because you're so burned that you have trouble sweating. He went back anyway. Um, and by all accounts was a, a favorite of his platoon and a great soldier. Uh, went through several explosions where he was lightly injured but made it back in one piece from the second deployment. Um, quickly had, went into sort of a spiral of, of what was probably a combination of, of, of PTSD, TBI, and, and who knows what other you know, combat stress injuries. Um, got divorced, picked up an assault charge, picked up two DUIs, uh, and then um, brought a gun to a party because he brought a gun anywhere, everywhere, like a lot of these guys did. A lot of these guys do, getting back from Iraq, carry guns everywhere. Um, and got into a, a, the type of fight that happens at house parties where there's a lot of beer. He was probably being obnoxious. Uh, they threw him out of the house. He sh sh you know, shouted at them on the lawn. They shouted at him. And then he drove back past the house and just unloaded on them, shot a pregnant woman. Um, she uh, was only minorly injured, but he was uh, charged with uh, attempted murder. Um, in the trial, the judge, the attorney said to the judge, you know, look, here's his combat experience. Here's uh, um, all this diet. He was diagnosed, actually, by the Army with PTSD and TBI and re received sub sub substandard care. She laid this out to the court. The judge decided to max him out. Um, He's now doing 50 years. Uh, Ryan Krebs, the um, medic, did another tour. Halfway through the tour, he decided that he was so against what they were doing that he was gonna um, not load his weapon anymore. In Iraq, uh, combat medics carry weapons. Um, hoping both that he wouldn't contribute to the violence and that somebody would kill him. And it's sort of, you know, suicide by war. You know? um, it didn't happen. He came home um, and really attempted suicide. 
um, was um, diagnosed with PTSD, TBI, depression, um, put on a load of meds, which he really didn't feel were doing anything, uh, but is doing much better now. Um, he's now on the GI Bill, uh, going to school in Denver. Um, is sort of slowly coming out of his, his shell, and uh, he's married, uh, doing pretty well. Um, other guys that I mentioned in here, I, I sort of gave you an abridged version, but there are other guys who are just barely mentioned in here who are not doing as well. Um, you know, big uh, substance abuse problems, <coughs> marginally employed, um, a number of minor convictions for things like uh, menacing, you know, waving a gun around, punching somebody at a bar, things like that. That's really common. Um, there, there are many more guys in the book who, who meet some pretty bad ends, and I just thought it was really important um, to not let the Army uh, deny that this had happened. And so that's why we wanted to, to, to document it, to create a lasting record. Um, so otherwise, they, they would have just said, well, if there hadn't been somebody to actually run the numbers and say, no, you know, what you've done to these guys is, is abhorrent and look at the results for all of us. For, for, even for us, like, I, I'm the, the typical person who's been untouched by the war. There's no draft. Um, no one in my family is in the war. And yet, it, it came to my town in a way that we couldn't ignore. Um, and so we wanted to leave a, a record of that. I will say, um, Partially because of this book, and partially because of the work of some very passionate uh, advocates, veterans advocates in um, Colorado Springs, the Army has gotten a lot better at how it treats these guys when they come home. When a lot of these first guys I mentioned came home, if you started screwing up, if you were missing formation, uh, obviously struggling with, with um, uh, PTSD, substance abuse, maybe smoking a joint to calm your nerves, they just kick you out of the army. They don't want to deal with you. They don't want to deal with the expense and the hassle of trying to, to rehabilitate you. That's really different now. Uh, there's better screening. Um, and it's screening that relies on your battle buddies. People who were there with you in combat who say, yeah, Dave Phillips, he may have said on the checklist that he's okay, but his best friend was shot right next to him. You know, he was only almost blown up three times. He's been drinking a lot. He's my friend. We need to, to make sure that he, he goes through some of these programs. And those programs are now there for these guys because we've been at war for a decade. And the, the Department of Defense has literally spent hundreds of millions of dollars um, ramping up this social services stuff. But someone said it, maybe not in this, not here, but earlier today. Uh, well, you said there's no cure for PTSD. There's no cure for PTSD. Uh, there are some effective treatments. Um, that can minimize some of your symptoms. But obviously, the best thing to do is, is not make any more cases. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, I, I left this really open, um, I, and there's a lot more to it. There's a lot more detail from the book, obviously. I have it for sale at a discount price if, if anyone's interested. But maybe if we have any time left, we have like 10 minutes, we could just sort of. Question. But why don't you come back up and we just sort of... I'm up. I'll, I'll point, right. but we'll, we'll, we'll both take questions, please. Well, I, I've done stories myself on, on the Veterans Court in Philadelphia, and, with, and I know a, a guy in Vietnam vet in the crater from prison is in for murder, clearly PTSD, he's done 35 years, he's nuts. But uh, what, the question that I got is, I mean, a lot of the problem is that the justice system is such a goddamn disaster. That uh, you know, uh, so that you know, there's tremendous amounts of mitigating circumstances that the justice system should take into consideration. One of them being what we're talking about here. Yeah. Uh, so, but there's many, many others, especially in the city of Philadelphia, where I teach in prison in Philadelphia. And uh, the justice system, especially yeah. in a place like Philadelphia, is just a disaster. Well, Fort Carson's in El Paso yeah. County. It's a huge military uh, community, not only active duty but retiree. They throw the book at these guys yeah. like you wouldn't believe. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And maybe it's because they, of like a, a shame or something, you know, like yeah. because you're part yeah. of that family, it's like, oh, you disgraced, you disgraced us as veterans. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of our judges are veterans. 
um, and that can swing both ways, you know. Yeah. But the Philadelphia court, have been, they, you know, the, the judge, he's, he's a good man, but they rah rah up the flag, you know, and they bring everybody in there. They give them these medals with flags, and you know, it's just and they give them they're kind of years. missing the point a little bit. <coughs> so, you know, you know I, I was thinking what, with what Dave uh, was saying as he was reading that. I, I wish that was required to read in a court before yeah. the judge could turn it over to the jury. Because I guess my question is, if you tried to put yourself in the place of those veterans that he's writing about, how the hell would you begin to get over it? What would you do? Suicide, that works. But if you don't get over it, you learn to live with it. And someone mentioned about that. I, I went to counseling in 1981. I went to Vietnam Outreach Center when they first opened. You have to understand the Viet. Do you even in here go to a Vietnam Outreach Center? Was your counselor a veteran? Yep. yep. My count uh, in in Las Vegas, Nevada. In order to be a counselor in the Vietnam Outreach Center, you had to be a Vietnam veteran. End of story. And you know how many pills I got in one year of treatment? They never even gave us an aspirin. <laughs> but what they did is try to teach you how to live with it. Yeah. And then the VA took over the vet centers, and now, I'm sorry I teach in the university, but now you've got college kids who read a book about veterans, and now they're telling you how to get over your PTSD. And a lot of vets kind of roll their eyes up and say, well, at least I'm not coming back. Yeah. You know, yeah, that's a real, that, it's, a, it's a real problem around the country. Yeah. Right here? Yeah, I've got a prediction for Dave Phillips and a question for Dr. Brown here. Prediction. Um, you're going to have a hell of a time negotiating the movie rights for this book in Hollywood. They're not going to touch it. <laughs> and that's part of our problem because the DOD is going to only approve and help the production of glamour. Right, right, right. Yeah. yeah. And here's the question. Um, for a long time in the social sciences, we've been going through a postmodern night of phenomenology, of relative truth. We're finally getting out of it, and social scientists are finally beginning to use the C word, class, social class. Yeah. Uh, a book has come out recently called The Casualty Gap, and it shows what everybody in this room probably already knows, and that is that with the exception of World War II, it is the poor, it is the working class, it's the lower middle yeah. class who are born the brunt. Yeah. Now, do you have some hunches about how that plays out in our pay-to-play judicial system? Yeah, they're going to get indigent defense counseling. Ninety-five yeah, percent exactly. of all the case, all the cases that I've I've had over the past two years, ninety-five percent of them it's indigent defense. You know, and now you've got another problem with indigent defense. This is not a criticism of the indigent defense attorney. Because we have one in here and she'd get real pissed if I said something. <laughs> but here's the deal. When you have, when you start making budget cuts in the criminal justice system, what's the first one to get cut? Defense, public defender's offices. Here, right where we're at right now, public, defend public defenders, they're cut and the prosecutors get raises every year. So you, you think about that. But as far as your class, uh, real quick on this, uh, these numbers are from a study that I've done over two years, started in Minneapolis at the Veterans for Peace Conference. I've interviewed 162 Iraq, Afghanistan vets in 16 states. My primary question, my research question was, what is the difference between these Iraq, Afghanistan veterans who are not my clients and my clients, and reluctantly, I've got an answer. These guys haven't gotten caught. Because if you look at the characteristics, you look at the demographics, you look at the history, you look at the education, it's all the same. 